Welcome, friends, to Breakfast in the Ruins, a Michael Moorcock flavoured podcast. On this show, we welcome musician, producer, and author Alistair Thompson to Derry and Toms. Alistair's debut novel, The Music of the Spheres, is a Moorcockian love letter to the psych and space rock scenes with a crime and science fiction bent. The blurb on the back of the book says It's an alternate 1968 in which recreational drugs aren't illegal. In fact, Giant pharma companies push them as regulated products with full governmental sanction to a class of drugged-out hippies that are nothing but cash cows living in a fake counterculture. Musician Simon Hastings of leading psychedelic band The Spheres discovers the true callous darkness of this arrangement when his band's singer is poisoned by one of these drugs and it's clear the death was a professional hit. Through a dystopian landscape, Hastings determinedly searches for the murderer with the help of a cast of eccentric psychedelic rock heroes. Hastings gradually becomes aware that true rebellion will require a lot more than just blissing out and making noise. We get into the story behind the book, but also Alistair's expansive catalogue as a musician, and, of course, his love of Moorcock, and a little bit of politics. As it happens, the forces of the singularity were arrayed against us when we were trying to do this, and we had numerous issues to contend with along the way, causing delays and some technical issues, even a blue screen of death mid-recording on my PC. As a result, we had to patch together our discussion from backup recordings made by the listening station on Earth-13. It's a bit choppy in places, but it held together until the disruptors caused that entire hemisphere to fold. All hands at the station were lost. But anyway, Alistair was a great guest, and we had a terrific time. So sit back, tune up your high flyer, and join us as we talk about the music of the spheres. Right, we're back in Derry and Tom's with a very special guest, Alistair Thompson, a.k.a. Gateless Gate, a.k.a. Cal Tengri, a.k.a. several other musical personas. Um, welcome to Derry and Tom's, Alistair. Thank you very much, Andy. Glad to be here with you today. We, I think we connected on Twitter quite a while back when I posted something about uh, an episode on Mocock and music, and you clued me into your Mel Nibiner track by Gateless Gate. Yes, that uh, that's that's how it happened, because uh, I, I followed a few Mocock-related things. Uh, we're going to get into uh, why I do that, why I'm so into him, I'm sure. But uh, I was doing a, a spooky sort of album, and it had some wave sounds, that I uh, a field recording that I'd used, and I thought, wait a minute, I can picture these, you know, tall white people torturing people <laughs> on, the, on the Dreaming Isle. You know, that's how that came about. Yeah, and then of course, a short while later, I started the um, Breakfast in the Ruins internet radio feed, and of course, you were kind enough to allow me to play some of your gear on there. So if anybody's listening, there is tracks by Gateless Gate and Cal Tengri. And a couple of other bits and pieces on there as well, because, of course, you did, like, a, a folk rock... Was it a collaboration um, that you released about six months ago? I have done a couple of collaborations in the last six months. One is folky and one is more of a kraut rock type of thing. Yeah, so, so there's, a, there's some of your content on there that people can check out. But, of course, um, the reason why we're here is you've also released your debut novel, The Music of the Spheres. That's correct. Now, I... Uh, I was delighted to get hold of a copy of this from an online bookstore, and it's an intriguing blend of alternate history, counterculture, psychedelic murder mystery thriller. Is that fair? <laughs> that's that's right. Well, I mean, the genesis of this book actually goes back 20 years. It's a bit of a tale. Um, I've been working for a publishing company for a few years. This is around the turn of the millennium. Uh, and the publishing company did mainly crime fiction, which I hadn't really read much of before other than, you know, Agatha Christie. So I was editing a lot of murder mystery fiction. And I was working on these 80,000 word novels. And at a certain point, I thought, I should try doing this. You know, it can't be that hard. So I spent the better part of a, a cold winter realizing that it is actually quite hard to generate that much <laughs> coherent copy. And I wanted to make it easy for myself. So, you know, I was working on crime fiction. So I said, let's make a crime fiction plot the heart of this. But I was an avid science fiction reader and heavily, heavily into, you know, old psychedelic progressive rock music. So I thought, how can I blend all of these things together? And 
Yeah. Uh, historical fiction requires a good deal of research because people will rake you over the coals, you know, for any inaccuracies. There's, there's big fans of that kind of thing. Uh, I have a history degree, so I agree with that. So what alternate history does is it allows you to play around with the facts and just come up with whatever you want for whatever purpose you have. And so that just unleashed all this sort of creativity in me, uh, you know, renaming the bands, making up new events in European history. And so that all came together in, in what I guess is a mishmash of a novel to an extent, but one that I hope does you know, read coherently and entertainingly. Uh, and so the rest of the story is after sending out a, a few paper copies to agents at the time, because that's, that's how things were done back then. You had to mail things yep. and getting a few rejections. I shelved it for the time being. And then by the time that I thought uh, I'd like to try again, I thought it was lost. I couldn't find the disc. I couldn't find the file. You know, and that was pretty heartbreaking. Mm, I can imagine. Uh, but, you know, life moves on, and I did. Until a few years ago, after um, several moves, actually, I found an old binder with a printout, which, for some reason, I had I had done back in 2001. I looked at it, and I thought, well, this is not as bad as I thought it was back in, you know, when I was a kid. I can use my you know, wisdom from the last 20 years of working in publishing uh, and my greater maturity to fix this thing up, revise it, and make it into what I always wanted. And so I've spent the last few years painstakingly retyping and revising the novel. And here it is. So we'll get a, a little bit into the, the meat of the novel, but of course one of the really, really intriguing things about it is it's full of kind of analogue versions of, um, or analogues of, well-known psychedelic rockers, Moorcock himself. There's there's kind of a an alternate version of Moorcock in there, which is brilliant. There's a lot, nice little bit of Moorcock pastiche in there as well, which which I really enjoyed. But when you set out to do something on this kind of scale, how much of it was based upon just your own natural knowledge of of the of the counterculture scene, for example, in in London at the time, and how much of it was like a labour of love when it comes to things like research? Oh, I was heavily, heavily heavily into that kind of music and, and the history of that scene. So, I, I mean, I didn't really need to do much research on the music or, or the people because I was also not trying to pretend that I knew what the people were really like. I mean, how could I? So they're sort of stylized versions of people like, you know, Dave Brock or Robert Wyatt or whatever. They're not really meant to be the real people. They're just meant to be yeah. tributes to the fact that they existed and, and that I admire them. And uh, yeah, that's just how it came about in that sense. And I, I'd been, I have spent a fair amount of time in London. Uh, I worked there for a summer after high school and uh, because I have family in the UK, we visited quite a bit. So I've been to Notting Hill and, and Ladbroke Grove and all of that. The, 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 the modern versions with the counterculture gone, but it, at least yeah. it gave me an ability to visualize the places. And then I did a bit of research on, you know, where some of the locations of say the historic music venues were, because I wanted that to be, somewhat accurate where was middle earth where was the ufo club you know that that sort of thing it wasn't as much research as you might think so before we kind of get into the book um we've mentioned michael mocock already and naturally this is a michael mocock flavored podcast so what's your history with mocock and genre fiction well i grew up on fantasy fiction because my mother was one of those people who were born in the 40s who became massive Tolkien enthusiasts, which she remains to this day. And so mm -hmm. she had us reading The Lord of the Rings when we were, you know, seven, eight years old, uh, as well as other uh, kids' fantasy series like The Dark is Rising by Susan Cooper, which is, is a classic, or uh, Lloyd Alexander's Pridden Chronicles. So we, we read all of those. And I distinctly remember, I don't remember whether I was 11 or 12, one of those two years. We were in the UK at a, a railway station, and my mother allowed me to choose a book from the Smiths in the station. And I picked up this slim little paperback with this strange looking airship on the cover. And it was uh, the warlord of the air. And uh, I was fascinated by the, by the, obviously they did a good job at the cover. But anyway, I, I mean, I got really into that at the, I think, I'm pretty sure I must have been about 12 years old. That started mm -hmm. me off with Moorcock uh, and with alternate history, really, and history in general. Uh, and after that, I read other books probably that I shouldn't have been reading at that age, like Behold the Man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. And then moved on to, I mean, El Elric was a bit later, but that, mm. that was the start. And really, I learned a lot about history 
and the personalities of the 20th century from my youthful reading of those Moorcock books. Who I owe a lot to him in terms of shaping me as a as an adult. It's a real dad, I would say. So he became my favorite science fiction author, even after and fantasy, even after reading all the other greats. And I, I mean, I pretty well read them all in the last few decades. Is Moorcock someone who's kind of stuck with you as you've gone along? I mean, you've done music inspired by him, and obviously there's a there's a great deal of um, kind of I think Moorcockian flavor in the music of the Spheres. It's, it's it's funny. I also started with Wall Out of the Air, but also um, Stormbringer, and actually that copy of Stormbringer is just on my shelf over my shoulder with a terrible Jack Garn cover, and the Ace Pocket Books edition from the late 60s. And I kind of went down a rabbit hole with Moorcock for a long, long, long time. But this podcast came about because I decided to start doing a grand reread, and a lot of them I hadn't read for 20 or 25 years. So how is Moorcock standing up for you these days? Uh, there are Moorcock books that I haven't read since I was a teenager or in my 20s. Uh, when my early 20s, I used to go to downtown Toronto to use bookshops and buy up every single Moorcock I could find and, and read it. And there was a lot of them. Uh, the ones that have probably stayed with me are probably the more literary titles, um, like Gloriana or Mother mm-hmm. London, the Piat Quartet. Yeah. Uh, that's things that show his, his deeper side. Although the Elric series has an existentialist bent that is, is philosophically appealing. The other, actually, um, so I don't forget it, The Dancers at the End of Time is mm-hmm. probably my other big favorite. I'm not, I consider that, even though it's fun and, and zany, to be a very literary book uh, taken as one, one volume. And I reread that every few years, no matter what. It's, it's on the reread list constantly. It has actually another big influence on, on how I wrote, I think. Yeah, there's a little chapter break about a third of the way through as well that's um, like a little bit of Moorcock pastiche. That's, there's definitely a little bit of dancers at the end of time in there. In, 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 just in the same way as you have these kind of um, slightly skewed analogues of real-life characters, there's a slightly skewed analogue of, well, either Jerry Carnelian or Jerry Cornelius and the Iron Orchid as well. So it was a real bit of dancers at the end of time flying off the page there, which was great, which I really, really appreciate. And then, of course... I'm sure we'll talk about this a little bit more, a little bit more later. Moorcock actually pops up in a kind of an alternate form in the following chapter in the uh, the Battle of Ladbrook Grove. But just I suppose just going back to this novel then. So the protagonist Simon Hastings is the kind of guy who would have turned up to a Jerry Cornelius six week long party on Ladbrook Grove in one of the Jerry Cornelius books. So just tell us a little bit about the the protagonist. Well, I mean, like most writers, particularly with their earlier works, the character definitely is an idealized version of me. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm a musician. I have similar interests to him. I have similar politics to him. Well, the same politics as him. And he's living the life that I would have liked to have lived as a psychedelic rock hero playing for, you know, audiences who love what he's doing. He's taking them on these spacious trips. And, you know, it's what I felt I was born 20 years too late to be. And I also, I never managed to find the right you know, group of psychedelic aficionados to play with to have my own <laughs> band like that. So I ended up making them myself in my basement. But I would say he's kind of an amalgam of me and, and Cornelius in a sense, because I sort of describe him physically as being similar. So I think Cornelius was in the background of my mind when I was writing that character, although he is far more uh, idealistic than, you know, the, the world weary ways that <laughs> Moorcock portrays Cornelius. I mean, I, I mean, I wrote this when I was younger, and so I was very idealistic. And, but I think I still retain those ideals. So, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable with Simon Hastings. I, th- I think anybody who, anybody who writes a protagonist, I think probably to some extent taps on their younger idealism. And I, th- I think Moorcock was doing as well in his own strange way when he created, when he created the tormented emo kid Elric <laughs> back in the early 60s. But, yeah, so you, your setup is you've got um, Simon Hastings, who's in this... Uh, this psychedelic rock band who were surrounded by a whole scene of psychedelic rock bands. And this is one of the things that I really enjoyed, not just the sense of alternate history, which is, um, of course, shot throughout the book, but also the, the humour. Even though it's not, it's not a comical book, there is a, a wicked sense of humour that's shot through it. Because actually, it's, it's got, it gets quite a sombre tone at times, on particular moments, which um, I'll, and I'll, I'll refer to one of them. But I was... 
laughing loudly at a description of a concert where the Pink Gremlins audience interaction consists of throwing shot puts <laughs> into the audience, which I loved. And then there's also a, a band called the Mutton Chop Killers. And I was reading this a couple of weeks ago and Phil, we were in bed and Phil, my partner, was asleep. And I woke her up laughing at the, the Mutton Chop Killers song titles. I'm going to read some of them here. And of course, the uh, the Mutton Chop Killers is the band that has someone called Ned Lugent <laughs> in the band. And the uh, the song titles are Vegetarians Are Stupid, Gonna Kill Me Some Hippie, and Nuke the Peacenicks Now. And that's the point at which I burst out laughing and, and woke Phil up. And I had, to, uh, I had to actually kind of explain this to her at about half past one in the morning, why I was, uh, why I was laughing heartily at some of the content of this book. So, I mean, it, it is very, very funny and very keenly observed. Is, is that something you were going for? Because, of course, it does become essentially not a spy thriller, but a, a murder mystery thriller when the, the lead guy, Guy Calvert, in Simon Hastings' band is murdered by terrible OTT drugs. Well, I mean, I look at this as a, as a dark comedy, so my own natural bleakness, unfortunately, seeped in. Uh, but there is an influence for that humour. The, the other children, the, the children's author that most influenced me when I was growing up is an American beatnik uh, named Daniel Pinkwater. Obviously, his last name isn't really Pinkwater, but that was the, the name he assumed. And he's written hundreds of, of YA and children's books that are really, really humorous and are influenced by things like Zen Buddhism, other kinds of Eastern spirituality, but which he was imparting to readers in a fun way, kind of like David Allen from, from Gong, but musically. And there was a, a couple of books where he had, you know, fake rock bands or rock albums that the kids were listening to, and he'd make up these zany titles for the for the, the albums. I forget now what, what they were off the top of my head, but um, there was one book titled The Snark Owl Boys and the Avocado of Death, which my sister and I loved when we were kids. <laughs> and that really influenced how I wrote humor, I think. Yeah. So, and that really seeped in along with that, the more cocky, the more cocky could be very witty. The dancers at the end of time is extremely mm. funny, you know? So it's a bit of a combination of that, but I can't resist being depressing. You know, it's just, people, a lot of people don't like the ending of the book that I know. They say, how, why did you end it in such a bleak way? And I say, well, yeah. you know, that's what felt appropriate to me. Well, un unlike when we cover mock-up books, this is this is a brand new release. We're not gonna we're not gonna spoil anything for anybody. Although we will talk about some some features of the book. But yeah, we're definitely not gonna give any spoilers. But again, it's it's what I really enjoyed was that we've got this set and we've got this alternate history setup where New York is part of Virginia, which is still part of the Empire, an empire where we've got Enoch Powell in charge and still in government in London. And the scenes in London a little bit later on with the, the right wing mob and the gangs, um, you know, being whipped up into a frenzy to take on the hippies. And, and again, there's, there's something I, I was reading it and a lot of it's even though it's about a counterculture alternate world set in the 70s and you wrote it quite a while ago. It's quite remarkable how prescient some of it is given what's going on at the moment. That's one of the reasons why I decided to, to put it out, is I, mm. when I was reading it, I thought this is more relevant now than it was when I wrote it. Um, and I was always sort of an anti-fascist kid, and I was always sort of anti-capitalist by nature. Yeah. Uh, but back then, I mean, we had, you know, George W. Bush and Dick Cheney and Ronald Reagan, but, you know, the tone has become much more open now with, with the yeah. right. Uh, and so, you know, it might have felt a little exaggerated to me at the time, but now it does not because people like these right wing mobs, they're out there. They just now they're on, on the Internet as well. But I mean, it was it just it felt really relevant to me. Yeah, I think the first moment where I realized that there was actually a, a more serious and somber tone was after the death of Guy Calvert. Hastings catches a cab. And there are some alternate history details about the Profumo government, but also a teary cab driver references the deaths of his extended family and seven million others, kind of an anchoring what up until now has been quite a breezy, amusing jaunt into something suddenly really real and, um, and urgent and really tied to the real world atrocities that have happened in our own world. And, and that's very, um, that's very Mococcian in a way, is to have this kind of, you know, the, the beginnings of this adventure story, but then not a casual reference, but a reference to something which it really anchors it 
in real life. And actually, this this might be an alternate history, but this is a world where bad things happen. And then all of a sudden, you're like, "All oh, right, okay, we're we're on a journey here in this in this this other world." But actually, it's, this is a this is a serious thing. Yeah, and I want one of the reasons well, I wrote it as an alternate history is I wanted it to be a world where people like Simon Hastings matter, where their their music and their counterculture is actually affecting the real culture and is a, is a threat to the powers that be. Because the mm. people in the '60s in in our world felt they were going to change the world. And that's why we respond to what they did. I'm not one of those people who's going to say all oh, the hippies sold out or whatever, but the fact is it didn't really work. Like, there were some, some progressive things that came out of the sixties that, that we really value. But a lot of that generation went on to become the Steve Jobses and, you know, the, the Richard Bransons, they, they, they it could be said that they did sell out a lot of their ideals mm. and their, their music and their culture became co-opted. Actually, that is really, that's the major theme of this book for me is that some people might think it's not to get spoilers, but some people might think it's an anti-drug book, but in fact, it's not about that. It's about how anything that you think is radical and different and can change the world is going to be co-opted mm. by capitalism and absorbed and made money off of like they do with greenwashing now or the mm. way LGBTQ stuff during pride month, you know, you see the major corporations changing to the pride flag on their logo. It doesn't mean anything to them other than another way to make money. Yeah. So I wanted to write a world where the, the, the counterculture is fighting using their art, not necessarily violence, but their art to, to, to fight against and overcome those, those evil forces of capitalism and, and absolute power. So that was, I mean, really was what I wanted to achieve message wise. And I think that really shines through. And, and had I read this five years ago, I don't think it would have had as much impact as it has now because while I'm reading this over the last couple of weeks, we're getting reclaim pride marches because people are, are so sick of the corporate co-opting of, of, of the pride movement. And th- there's a lot of other things been going on, certainly in the UK recently. We'll get back to some lighter stuff shortly. <laughs> but I was, I was reading one part of it and, and some, a couple of things really, I was skim reading it again today on the train back from Birmingham and a couple of things really resonated. And first, there's a point where Simon's reconnected with some of his buddies at Middle Earth, some of his other band buddies, and someone gives him some horrifically strong acid. And he has this terrible trip. And when he when he is half recovered, he drives home to his dad's after this particularly evil dose in an old mini. And there's a reference to the engine sputtering pathetically. Now, for different reasons to what I'll talk about shortly, I was I was instantly transported back to the early 90s when my first car was a 1973 Mini, <laughs> where if you put your foot down too hard, your foot would go through the rusted floor and the engine had certainly seen better days. But it was it was like a, a maroon box of joy. I loved that car. And and when I was um, that age, lots of my friends had Minis as well. And amazingly, there was there was an 850 cc Mini which is ridiculous, really, when you think by modern standards, that's, you know, something which were, I mean, there were basically cigarette boxes on wheels with what was a large motorcycle engine. <laughs> so that was the first thing that I really enjoyed when I was skim reading it. But the other thing, which is perhaps a little bit more, um, bit more serious, there's a paragraph at the page of 108, and end of page 108, when he's talking to his, um, his compadre and kind of girlfriend, Teresa, and it says, uh, Teresa scowled. You're really out of it, aren't you? Haven't you watched TV or read the papers at all? Haven't you heard how capitalist right-wing politicians and their media mouthpieces are deliberately fermenting violence and prejudice by pitting common workers against their natural allies in the urban counterculture? Now, we're, we're suddenly at this point where there is a, a movement, not just in the UK, but in the USA and in a lot of other European countries, where that's exactly what's happening. And only this weekend, we've had a UK minister accusing people of cowering from a virus, whilst people have been whipped up by this war on work, or this culture war, as they're referring to it, are actually running events in London and as, as massive vaccine protests. And speakers are saying that the, one speaker said that the noose awaits NHS staff who are complicit with what they believe is a massive conspiracy theory with all sorts of wild things about um, killer lampposts and 5G energy rays and and gene therapy by stealth. 
and this is this is all being whipped up and fermented by um, right wing politicians, and and it's it's happening in the USA with you know with the large elements of the Republican Party. So again, I'm reading this, and and this is it really really touches a nerve. It's 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 really current, and um, yeah, and that's one of the bits that quite I, on the nose. That's one of the bits that I wrote in in the year two thousand. So I'm, I don't want to blow my own horn, but obviously, <laughs> youthful me knew something was coming yeah. <laughs> somehow. Whatever you were smoking, it was giving you valuable insights into uh, into what was to come. I was smoking cynicism, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> Not silk cuts. Well. I had I had my dalliance with that at one point, but that's a long time ago. Because <laughs> that's one of the other things. Again, there's some lovely references in there. I did chuckle at um, Sam and Hastings smoking silk cuts. Um, but also there's a wonderful bit where it says he listens to the latest Delia Derbyshire album. Going back to, to some of the other great stuff, some of the great world building that there is in this, before we get to that kind of Ladbroke Grove scene shortly after this where these exchanges take place, there's the scene in Columbia. And again, there's some really marvellous science fiction imagery there. And I can't remember the exact words, but there's the Dome over Columbia and you have the Colombian cartels effectively run a government and they've placed a dome over Bogota where they pipe cocaine into the atmosphere and um, the barriers are clung to the outside of the dome like limpets. And it's, 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 it's just fantastically um, evocative. And as soon as I read that, I was thinking, oh, I'm going to use this in a game at some point. Because, of course, I'm a, I'm a role-playing game kind of guy. There's so much stuff in here that I'm thinking, I'm going to, I'm going to have this in a game. That's, what a fantastic idea to not just have a chase through a barrier, but have a chase through a barrier which is way high up on the side of a dome covering Bogota. It's just fantastic. Really great imagery. Well, thank you very much. I mean, that was one of the more far-out <laughs> aspects of it. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I did enjoy the, the cartels thing because... You know, we, we, we frown on, on what they do because they're organized criminals. But mm. in this world I've created, they're the legitimate government and they're on a, the same standing as any other kind of corporation. Because to my mind, there's not that much difference between them. You know, between a, a, the way a rapacious, say, energy corporation works in the world and a crime mm. cartel. So in that world, they're running the show and they're doing business with, you know, legitimately. Yeah. There was always a point behind everything, I guess. I was, I was trying to score points, but I tried to do it in a in a fun way, and I guess that's how I came up with all the, the Colombian imagery. So I, we're not going to spoil the book, but how would you describe it to someone completely new to this kind of genre? Well, I had trouble, as you can tell, which is why I came up with all those genre tags for it. I, I, would, I do describe it as a psychedelic rock crime novel, because yeah. while, while some people are enjoying it who don't appreciate this kind of music, I think it really helps if you are a music enthusiast. Um, yeah. But also because I come from editing that kind of work, crime fiction in particular, and I still edit tons of mysteries, uh, I want to emphasize that there is there is a whodunit aspect, like a thriller aspect to it. So, yeah. I mean, that's re that's what I'm hanging my hat on with this, I guess. Uh, I don't want to. I don't really emphasize the political stuff too much when I'm talking about it generally, because a lot of people don't. You know, they don't want to get hit over the head with that, unfortunately. Well, I think what you've got here is number one. It's it's a fantastic kind of alternate history sci-fi thriller. So there are certain elements in it which, you know, in any other kind of setting, you would describe them as the Dome over Bogota, for example, is is, is something straight out of a, a classic 80s cyberpunk novel. It's So, so there's elements of cyberpunk. There's all, all of the references to music. Um, there's, there's stuff in there for fans of that genre. I mean, you know, anybody who's into Hawkwind and, and that kind of range of bands from back and around that era, we'll have a field day picking out what do the kids call them these days? Easter eggs, don't they? It's Easter eggs that you get in um, in movies and video games these days. I think this is uh, a really interesting and rewarding novel with, that actually has, has really got something to say. And for that reason, I think it's great. And I, I recommend people should definitely pick it up. But if you're a Mocock fan or a Hawkwind fan, or a fan of psychedelic rock, or just a fan of crime novels. So actually, if you're an Agatha Christie fan, <laughs> a Hawkwind fan, or a Mocock fan, get this book and read it and enjoy it. So what next? You wrote this 20 years ago. Have you got any other 
fantastic novels kicking around in drawers somewhere that you thought you'd lost? I have not. I mean, I have ideas. There is, despite some of the, the ways this story concludes, there are ideas for a possible sequel. I don't know. I don't know if that will come about. Uh, but I, there, there is a, I could do it. Let's put it that way. All the other ideas I've had for fiction have been uh, completely different to this. Uh, some historical fiction concepts. Um, because I, I do have a history degree and I read a lot of history books. I have, a, I have a strong interest in Russian history for some reason I can't discern. So I had an idea based on a book that I, I read. Uh, but histor- like I said at the beginning, historical fiction takes so much research. You know, mm-hmm. so much exacting. Sometimes, maybe not primary, but a lot of secondary research. So <laughs> we'll see if I get around. I mean, I'll have to see how this how this one goes, how this one gets out there. Because, you know, music is definitely still my number one pursuit and there's only so many hours in the day but i would like to do more writing for sure and of course we need to talk about your music as well don't we because you know you record under the name gateless gate and numerous other things so how did you get into music originally what was what was your gateway well in my early teens i went through a a period that i think my mother felt was slightly hooliganish but in in terms of actual human behavior was very mild i mean we're an extremely well-behaved family so Sneaking out of the house a few times in the night was, was to her was, you know, a sign of my decline, my moral decline. <laughs> so she said, you're going you're gonna to play an instrument. We're going to distract you. <laughs> so I picked guitar because I was looking to punk bands and goth bands at the time, I think, at 14. Yeah. That's what started me off. And then my tastes, of course, every year you're in school, your tastes go to some other thing that you think is cool. And so I ended up listening to a lot of folk music, progressive rock, psychedelic rock. This is in about 1990, I guess. In addition to you know some some of my contemporary bands, but uh, that's that's what set me off on this journey. And of course, when I discovered that you know this author that I'd read since I was a child was played with a, a rock band or read poetry with a rock band, well, that's how I got to the to Hopwind eventually. But um, I started playing in bands when I was about nineteen. Um, I was in a band for a few years then that I didn't I didn't write the songs. I was actually the lead guitar player, and even though I could barely play. And uh, I started demoing my own music somewhere in my mid-twenties, so just before the year 2000. I joined another rock band, and then my own music went in the background again. I was in a glam rock band called Crash Kelly, like full-on, you know, T-Rex with, with some power pop, cheap trip type stuff. I had big hair and flares. We even toured the UK a couple of times <laughs> nice. in the early 2000s. And so this is why my me going full bore into my own music waited until my mid thirties. I didn't really, you know, I did some demoing and, and some tentative releases around two thousand, but my own music really started going, you know, full bore around two thousand nine. And since mm. then, I've been far too productive, I would say. Well, you, you've certainly got a a, um, a prodigious selection of output on on Bandcamp. So, what what drew you towards the more synthy side of stuff? That was just as my taste developed. I came late, surprisingly late, listening to ambient music. Mm-hmm. Um, I had always listened to Robert Fripp's, um, his soundscapes when I was younger. But uh, so for some reason, I didn't clue in that there was this whole other genre of even more ambient music out there. Mm-hmm. And when I got into that, I really got into that. And that led me back more towards some other kinds of progressive music, like the earlier uh, Tangerine Dream, the, 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 the Berlin School, and, and things like that. Uh, and so that I became a big synth head because when I was 16, I was sort of like queen. I said, well, I hate, I hate synths. You know, that I was listening to Fairport Convention and wearing, you know, like hippie clothing and I liked fiddles. Yeah. <laughs> like to go ahead 10, 15 years. Now I'm all like synth pop. I love that. Sequencers. And so yeah. that's, that's how I mean, my taste then later developed more. I mean, I still like, like all that folk music. Don't get me wrong. But, yeah. uh, you know, I also developed an interest in electronic music. Which explains a lot of the different project names. Yeah, it's, it's it's a strange it's a strange pathway we we all have, isn't it? When it comes to music, I was I was much the same. I can remember Iron Maiden using synths on Seventh Son of a Seventh Son. I was like, "What's this?" I was I, I was a little bit outraged <laughs> as like a sixteen or seventeen year old or whatever. I mean, I think they'd actually used them on somewhere in time already, but I was a little bit outraged that there was out and out synth use. Um, but a couple of years later, I was absolutely devastated when they dropped it all. And uh, and went on to other things, and, and then later on, very similar, got into things like uh, electro pop. I think that was largely through my mates Wayne and Chris were enormous Depeche Mode fans, right? 
and uh, I was aware of Depeche Mode, of course. I'd seen them in the charts and uh, over the years, but I think it was, um, it was tracks off Violator where I suddenly realised, oh, hang on a minute, there's, there's, there's something a little bit a little bit more to this, so I could allow myself to listen to it because it didn't feel like electro-pop. And then, of course, six months later, I'm listening to all the albums and enjoying all of them, and I'm into electro-pop, and I'm in a, C- a second on CD shop buying Rio by Duran Duran. <laughs> And going back and even though to be fair, that's not electro pop. That's probably a little bit more like Ersatz Roxy music at times. But, uh, when you when you yeah. have the, the John Fox early eighties stuff and he's using yeah. it, using it in this cold, sort of nasty way, then you really hit the apex of synth pop and I love that stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um those guys, Wayne and Chris, they're they're still hugely into their synths. Now I don't know, I ain't got a Scooby Doo, I ain't got a clue how any of this equipment works, but I know I've got listeners who do. And I've got listeners like uh, Wern and Graham, for example, who've uh, just collaborated on uh, an album based upon The Black Corridor by Mokov. Oh, wow. They're, re- they're really into their gear. And um, so what, what kind of setup do you use? Well, I mean, uh, it's a little awkward for me because I, I don't really. I, one of the things I'm most proud of about all the music that I make is I make it with the most ridiculously simple setup you can imagine. I don't have <laughs> a single piece of outboard equipment. It's all just yeah. plugins that I get a hold of. I have a little MIDI keyboard, and it's just whatever I can get a hold of for for cheap or free. Um, the one thing that I have that, that I put spent a bit more on is the Mellotron plugin because I'm obsessed mm. with Mellotron, and it's it's Mtron, so it's the good one that you know emulates all the classic sounds. Uh, but I I mean I don't I don't I, I have respect for for gearheads. And I understand, you know, the quest for high fidelity sound, <laughs> but mm-hmm. there's a great deal of pleasure to working within limitations and getting the best yeah. you can out of what little you have and sort of MacGyvering it, as you might say, into yeah. So, I mean, my lecture about what gear I have is non-existent. <laughs> well, in a way, I, I got myself into trouble by even asking the question because I ain't got a clue what any of this stuff looks like. And uh, I caught a photograph of Wayne's gear and there's... It's like an old school telephone exchange with some of this old equipment. I don't know what it does, but it looks cool. Oh, I love seeing the pictures <laughs> of it, but I don't have any of it. Yeah. So when you're actually um, performing this music, you've got a few different monikers. So what's what's the kind of defined difference between your different musical identities? Well, to some degree, uh, you end up with regrets when you start doing that because you make music under a certain name, my name. Mm. I made folk rock. But then I wanted to make another kind of music, and I thought, well, no one's going to associate these they're going to think I'm, i've gone off on some tangent they won't follow me there so then i make yeah. up another name and i start doing the music under that name but then i there's a third kind of music i want to make it's like oh and now it's time for a new name and so <laughs> you end up with four or five names i mean i had another one that i recorded several albums under twilight fields it was called and i had that's making more atmospheric pop not pop pop, pop rock it was basically after i heard uh, anathema I got really into their stuff. They're the they're the yeah. they're the the goth metal band that later went into you know progressive rock. And I thought, well, I, these guys are making this kind of music that I always wanted to make this music too. This uplifting, beautiful, you know, atmospheric yeah. music. I should have just put that under my name, but no, I had to come up with a fancy name, Twilight Fields. And so I put out several albums of that, and everyone's confused. They don't know that's me. <laughs> the people like that don't know that it's me. Yeah. And so I don't know. It might have done me more harm than good to do that. But all that music is still available, of course. Uh, so, I mean, it's fun to come up with these project names, but uh, you do have regrets in the end, I think. Mm. So, uh, there's also Cal Tengri. So yeah, that's where I, mean, that. I started doing super psychedelic music. I was getting into the <laughs> 60s and 70s. That's where the Hawkwind type stuff was, was going yeah. on. And uh, I, I mean, yeah, I, I wanted to have a really cool sort of ominous sounding name. So I, I don't regret that one necessarily. Well, that's, I must say, some of my favourite stuff is the uh, is the Cal Tangri stuff. I did buy your discography on Bandcamp, and uh, I went through it all pretty much over the course of a couple of weeks, because, frankly, there's fucking tons of it, and you yeah. can't just get through it in an afternoon. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but the uh, there's, uh, the Cal Tangri stuff, I think, is absolutely fantastic. It's right up my street. And, and actually, if I was still doing face-to-face tabletop game and I'd be using it as, as mood music and background music for some of the games. I'm sure that opportunity will come up at some point. So um, what are you working on currently? Well, right now I'm going to be releasing an, a- an album under the Gateless Gate name, which is my main ambient slash Krautrock project. 
uh, and that'll be coming out on August 15th. Um, and uh, it's on a little label called Sour Orange Records. They're based mm. in Maine, and uh, it's a really, really nice chap who runs that. Uh, I've just recently released a tribute album. I've done two tribute albums, which is where you reinterpret a bunch of somebody's songs. Uh, this was to Stuart Adamson of Big Country, the Scottish mm. Celtic rock band, because I was yeah. huge into them in high school, and I still listen to their music. So I reinterpreted several Big Country songs, and I've just released that. And I also have a collaboration going with a, a, a gentleman called Wolfgang Merckx. He's from Germany. He's a re- one of those guys with all the gear. He's got every kind of synth you can imagine. So we do Kraut Rock together. We're working on our second album. Uh, I do the guitar vocal stuff, and he's going to put on all the weird 70s style Kraut Rock keyboards. And that, that's yeah. a lot of fun. So that's where I'm at at the moment. I'm going to um, I'm going to throw out some some big love actually for you. You also was this entirely you, the Sons of Birch's album, or was that collaborations? That was all me, and that's something I should have just released under the name Content because it's right. similar, but I was doing these more humorous songs, so then it didn't fit. And time for a new name, <laughs> Sons yeah. of Birches. Well, I would I would strongly recommend anybody who goes to Alistair's gatelessgate.bandcamp.com uh, page to look at the Sons of Birches album and check out Lost Johnny, We Took the Wrong Step Years Ago, because it's fantastic. That's probably one of my favourite tracks of yours. So you've, I mean, and also, if you go on there, you'll actually see the depth of your discography which is uh, huge but you know there's there's so much good stuff on there so in terms of writing you think there may be something further down the line and in terms of music you've said what else you're working on but it, in terms of kind of what you're currently being inspired by musically and what you're reading what what's kind of moving you and getting you inspired at the moment well like I said for some reason my pleasure reading which i you know, I, I don't have a ton of time for it because I, I work on books all day long and, and sometimes mm. I'm too burnt out. My pleasure reading for some reason has gone mainly towards uh, history, back towards history. And I've been reading a lot of things about uh, Russia, totalitarian <laughs> regimes in North Korea and China. <laughs> that, so I'm not sure if I would consider that inspiring. <laughs> it may, that may lead to a project eventually, I guess. Yeah. Uh, musically, I just keep finding new things all the time. For instance, uh, there's a, a band I've just dis- discovered myself called Crippled Black Phoenix. And even though this band is basically tailor-made for me in every single mm. regard, every regard, I had never tried their music before a few weeks ago. And so now yeah. I'm losing my mind over this. And, you know, it just as Anathema around 2014 really inspired me to, to, to go in that Twilight Fields direction. I can actually, you know, some of this, the darker, more, you know, the, those darker Floydian ballads that that band does may lead me back mm. into doing something like that again. Mm. And I'm constantly hearing new sort of ambient type acts as well. Uh, so I'm sort of on a, 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 just a steady trajectory of adding new things to what I already appreciate yeah. and, and mixing them in. And... Cripple Black Phoenix are another band that are incredibly prolific, aren't they? I first I'd, I came across them. It wasn't the first album. It was the one afterwards. Um, was it, they did a they released a double album, Resurrectionist and Night Raiders, and I think it's one of those that's got Bernd Reynolds on it. And I was just instantly hooked. And Cripple Black Phoenix for me are a first day buy for anything that they release. And e- even when they've released what they refer to as EPs, like um, No Sadness or Farewell, or um, the one with a wolf on the cover, the name of which escapes me. Just just absolutely incredible. And also, I think that, that was the EP where I got to the end of the listed tracks and then it launched into the end title music from Kelly's Heroes, <laughs> which is Burning Bridges, originally by the Mike Kerb con- Congregation. And, uh, and and they went into that, I suddenly realised this is, this is the greatest band in the world. <laughs> yeah, it's, just, it's just amazing when you, when you come across another band that... Uh, I came across one day uh, a few years ago was Hammock. The uh, they're sort of like the post rock ambient duo from America. Mm. And uh, the moment I put the album on, I thought, well, how how has this band been around since two thousand and four or whatever? And I'm just yeah. you know figuring this out now because I, yeah. I, to this day, even though post rock is this big genre uh, with a lot of sound alike bands, I've never found anybody else that sounds like them. And that that again has inspired me, you know, to 
you know, some of the stuff they've done has inspired me to not try to duplicate what they're doing, but you know how you can absorb the influences and, and it affects what you do. So yeah, you know, it's, it's exciting to be, you know, middle-aged and, and still learn mm -hmm. not, not to be stuck the way a lot of people are in terms of, you know, wanting to sound a particular, whatever, like whatever they heard when they were 25, wearing yeah. the same clothes that they were wearing when they were 25. I don't want to be like that. Well, there's a weird um, juxtaposition at the moment of of artists being uniquely in a position these days to make less money than they ever have before due to the existence of things like Spotify paying artists uh, really a pittance for their hard work, for plays and things like that. But on, on the other hand, sitting alongside that, it's almost like a golden age of music because people can promote themselves. There's a democratization um, in technology. Yeah. 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 And I, I don't get any music from anywhere other than Bandcamp these days, because Bandcamp just seems to service all of my needs. I re I've said this before on the show, I really should get a sponsorship deal with Bandcamp, because I think I've said that on a number of occasions. But I really don't look anywhere else for music, because it's just an astonishing variety of, of styles and sounds and it's it really is incredible i kept, kept very very recently came across a, a band called the meccano set who were a, a liverpool based kind of a new wave act who've, who've also done some more ambient stuff but they've done an entire album based on the final program and the, which they released like maybe six eight weeks ago and it's absolutely terrific and it's and it's only through going on Bandcamp or being on Twitter and, and kind of obviously on Twitter you have to curate your feed to try and filter out all of the you know the, the, the horrific stuff which there's plenty of um, but it's worth doing because you make those kind of contacts and of course without Twitter I never would have we never would have had that original conversation you know six months ago about your track Mel Nibbane so whilst it's a, I think it's a tough environment or a tough playing field for for musical artists these days it really is you're right it is democratized it is wide open for anybody to to do their stuff and get it out there so yeah it's for for, for a consumer yeah it's it's fantastic well musicians <laughs> need to understand that they need to have a certain mindset now the democratization means we can all make an album whenever we want because there's free software gear basic gear is cheap you can put things yeah. on Bandcamp. it's not hard to get your stuff on streaming services but you are going to be like a grass in a, a blade of grass in a field. So yeah. it doesn't matter how good you get at it, you, you are still going to struggle to get the, the wider notice. And we mm. all struggle at times with, you know, mentally with that, because a lot mm. of the time you, you feel you're improving with each release, but you're not necessarily getting any more feedback. It's not even necessarily about sales. It's just more knowing that you're reaching people because you don't get that feedback. You don't get that evidence. Unless you're, say, uh, someone who plays live, which no one can really do at the moment or has been mm. able to do. So it's a double-edged sword. I mean, the, the decline of the the model where you had to go and, and impress the record company to even have a, a chance of a career, uh, that's good. But at the same time now, because everybody can do something, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's definitely a, a tree in a forest sort of situation. But yes, uh, the, the thing with Bandcamp is it's more of a surprise that there isn't anything else like it. It just works so well yeah. for consumers and for musicians. But no one, there are, there's no real competition for it. Everyone just heads there. <laughs> yeah, that's that's never even occurred to me uh, to even think that. I mean, my, my Bandcamp library now is well, it's bloody enormous. When when I was going through the other day of looking at your releases in my in my library, I found I found things that I bought on a whim several albums that I bought on a whim and completely forgot about. I hadn't even got around to downloading because um, I'm still a little bit, I'm still I'm not quite analog, but I still like to have the, the WAVs on my hard drive so I can, I can switch on my, um, my monitors and, and listen to something of decent quality. Um, but I, I use the Bandcamp app on my phone if I'm on a train or something like that, but by and large, I like to have them. And there were things on there I've completely forgotten about. Um, somebody on Twitter had come along who, who did uh, Dungeon Synth and I thought, oh, I'll give them a listen, bought it, forgot all about it. Forgot all about it. Because that's, that's another one of the interesting discoveries I've made is Dungeon Synth. <laughs> yeah, I came across that fairly recently myself. There's yeah. all these interesting subgenres and, and subgenres of something like Vaporwave, which is something yeah. that the general population has no idea exists. But there's yeah. sub-subgenres of Vaporwave. 
the dungeon sin thing is funny because most of it just sounds like Tangerine Dream anyway, <laughs> but it's it's got yeah, a new name, Dungeon Sin. Yeah, and some of it sounds like Tangerine Dream done on an 8-bit computer. Yeah. But there's, but there's still something really charming about it. And one of the things I really love is, and this is completely ridiculous, is there are artists on Bandcamp doing, like, knocking their stuff out on cassettes with really nice handmade labels. And I am a complete mark and a sucker for physical media that looks pretty. So you'll see just over my shoulder here, I've got got four cassettes, one of which is Immortal Sword Volume 1, Dungeon Sin, on cassette. I ain't got a cassette player anymore. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I'm not sure of a cassette player, but I'm buying these bloody things. I've had yeah. I had offers a couple of times to from labels to do cassette versions, but for some reason yeah. I, I, I I respect that scene because it's the ultimate expression of DIY. So I admire yeah. it. But for some reason I just can't bring myself to release my music on cassette because back when they were used, I hated the damn things. They were constantly <laughs> breaking and you had to spool them together yeah. with a pencil and you know, they'd wear out quickly and you know. Yeah. I hate it. So it's a bit funny to see that they're back. Yeah, it is weird. And and back in the day, I didn't really use cassettes for music. If I was at home, I played records. And I, I know my first mini, that little maroon nineteen seventy three mini. I did it did have a, a an aftermarket cassette player bolted to the. Um, well, it wasn't really a dashboard. It was just a shelf which had the uh, the speedometer and the fuel dial kind of in the middle, just kind of bolted there on an oval. Um, like an oval panel, and this this shelf, of course, was always wet because the because uh, the seal around the windscreen was would leak. It was it was a terrible car, but I loved it. And then someone stole it and burnt it, the bastards. But I did love that car. Uh, it, it's it's hard to think back now with with modern cars of driving around North Yorkshire when I was a student nurse in in one of the worst winters we had for years, and I couldn't get the water to squirt onto my windscreen to try and clear the windscreen because it, you had to pump it with your thumb. <laughs> It was it was a thumb powered windscreen um, washer uh, system, and it was so cold that even with the um, the anti freeze for the windscreen water, it froze solid. That wouldn't anyway. last a day in a Canadian winter, I tell you that. <laughs> yeah, no, a bit, bit bit of a bit of a diversion there, but yeah. So I, I mean, I didn't really use to do cassettes at, even back then, and I'm and now I'm buying them. It's stupid. But the last cassette I had was Roll the Bones by Rush. And it permanently lived in the cassette player in a car that I had. And all I had was that cassette and a radio. So if I wasn't listening to the radio, I would play that endlessly to the point where it just warped and, and sounded absolutely horrendous. But it still it still felt really painful to get rid of it, but I did indeed get rid of it eventually. And I had that and Connected by the Stereo MCs are the only two albums I've ever bought on cassette in my entire life. Yet now I'm getting them off Bandcamp and I've got nothing to play them. Well, it's a bit the same with L- the LPs, isn't it? The comeback of yeah. the LP. You know, now, now you buy a new LP, it's, it's $40 Canadian. Yeah. You know, and uh, It's a premium thing. I, I used to go to the downtown when I was 16 and buy a used LPs by the armload. That's how I discovered a lot of music. They were all $5. That's how I got into Roxy Music, Genesis, all this stuff. I would see it. King Crimson, I remember, I saw that famous first album cover. I never heard of them. I thought, well, this has to be good. So I brought that home, and it was. That's how I discovered music. And now they want you to pay, you know, $40 for a, a new version of Fleetwood Mac's Rumors or something. So mm-hmm. it's it's different. It's now, now yeah. these are boutique sort of items, or the cassettes are definitely more of a DIY a statement than anything else. I am buying vinyl as well. I'm an idiot, really. Phil bought me some vinyl for my birthday a few years ago, and we went out. We went to Richer Sounds and bought a really nice turntable. Not one of these ridiculous, you know, over the top 300, 400 quid turntables that that look like a piece of MDF with a with a platter and an arm and no lid or anything like that. It was it was it was a sensible turntable. Um, went out and got a second-hand amplifier with a preamp, with a phono preamp in it. Got a pair of really nice speakers. Got them set up in the attic. Bought shitloads of vinyl in the last three years. Never go up there, never play it. <laughs> never go up there, never play it. Ridiculous. The house is filling up with this stuff again. And I got rid of all my vinyl years ago. I've, I got a hand. I think I got rid of probably when I moved from Bradford uh, Hull to Bradford when I met Phil. I think I got rid of eighty percent of my vinyl. And it all went to um, charity shops, and I brought, I just brought the hardcore vinyl that I couldn't bring myself to part with, and I've probably my vinyl collection has probably doubled in size now, and I never go up there and I never play it. It's ridiculous, but oh, the feel nice, <laughs> the 
feel nice and they look nice. But recently on eBay, I got a Chronicle of the Black Sword Live um, album because a few people have been on and talked about Hawkwind and say what a brilliant album it is because I'm, I'm a bit of a Philistine, I think. I actually don't like Chronicle of the Black Sword that much, the 80s album, but I keep being told that the live album is amazing. So I bought it, still haven't listened to it. Well, it's all right. I mean, you have to be into the pseudo metal period of Hawkwind there. I don't mind that stuff, but it, yeah, it's not my favorite either. I am a huge yeah. fan of, of Hugh Lloyd Langton as a guitar player, but some of the material was a little clunky, I thought, back then. Yeah. I, I think the 80s spoiled a lot of bands for me. You know, I like 70s Alice Cooper. I really need to revisit this stuff. If I, yeah. You find yourself revisiting it now. I listen to a lot of 80s music now. Yeah, and yeah. I don't mind the you know the boxy sounding snare gated snare drums and all that. I mean, it used to drive me crazy, but now yeah. for some reason I like a sprightly little eighties pop song. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, to be fair, so do I. And I, I, I do drive Phil mad because she actually was an eighties pop kid, but there's some eighties pop she doesn't actually like. So I put us together a, a kitchen playlist of all sorts of stuff. You know, more recent stuff that we like. Plenty of Ween, of, of course. Um, plenty of other bits and bobs. Even some, you know, some some hard rock and a little bit of thrash on there. But there's a lot of 80s pop on there. And uh, I, I think um, my credibility went down when I put Go West on. <laughs> but, but my memories as, as a kid, when, when I got that Rio album by Duran Duran from a second-hand shop in, oh, I don't know, whenever it was, probably the early 90s, and put it on. I knew every single song on it, and I knew every word to every song on it, because while I was in my bedroom listening to Black Sabbath or Iron Maiden or Slayer or whatever I was listening to when I was 16, if my album turned off, all I could hear from next door was Duran Duran and Go West. Yeah, it's the and, same with me and ABBA. My sister used to listen to ABBA when I was very young. And yeah. I can I know every, every single ABBA song to this day. <laughs> yeah. It just ends up burned into into the back of your brain, doesn't it? My other sister, she listened to nothing but Toya Wilcox through the early 80s. So a lot of that is burned into my brain as That's well. That's funny. I was just looking at her. Uh, I never listened to any of her or her band's music before. I was considering it. Would you recommend that? Um, I would recommend... Uh, now then, I'm going to have to check the name of the... I think it's her second album. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I was um, looking at the list. So. Is it The Blue Meaning? Which I really, really like. It's it's um, it's really it's it's kind of new wave, and, and the band's quite good as well. The Blue Meaning, yeah. And then she went. It all went a little bit more kind of solo in support of of her as a singer after Anthem, and from that point onwards. But those first two songs are just are pretty good new wave albums, I think. Yeah, I like, I like them a lot. We'll give that a try. Yeah, Blue Meaning in particular. Yeah. So, uh, Music of the Spheres is out now. So, where can people get it? Uh, the book is available on uh, Amazon, the various Amazons, both as an ebook and as print. But I do like to emphasize that uh, it's a bit of a compromise to use that service uh, ethically. So mm-hmm. I have recently made the ebook available on the Internet Archive. If people go to archive.org and search. You can read this book uh, for free if you want. The, the, all the, all the, the classy EPUB formats that work on all the devices. And if people you know like it so much they want to pay me, they can go to Bandcamp where most of my material is name your price anyway. Throw me a couple of bucks and get a, get an album out of it as well. So hmm. you know if you, somebody wants to pay me if, you know for doing this stuff they can. But if they want to just read this book for free, they're welcome to. If they want a deluxe paper copy with the beautiful cover, they will have to shop on Amazon, which we all have to do occasionally, I suppose. Hmm. But uh, yeah, that, that's yeah. Yeah, well, from time to time, we just have to suck up the fact that we have to support Bezos' giant space penis, don't we? It's uh, it's 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 a bugger, but you know, I, I do do it myself from time to time. Now, of course, on 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 that Amazon front, funnily enough, of course, when when I ordered this book a couple of months back, um, I think I told you, I'll let you know that um, the first one ended up getting left somewhere really stupid by a delivery driver and was soaking wet when I found it, so it got water damaged. However, they sent me another copy. So I feel like we've kind of struck a blow for the common man by making Amazon send me another one. But as it, what it actually means is I've got two copies now, and the one that was water damaged is dried out. And actually, that's the one I was reading and skimming through on the train earlier on. So I have a pristine, brand-new copy 
that's untouched of the music of the spheres by Alistair Thompson. So in some way, I think we should, you know, I think uh, maybe a competition, coming up with a crazy competition question off the top of our heads might be a bit tricky. But I think, well, I'll come up with somewhere, or I'll agree with Alistair somewhere, to identify a way to get this out to somebody in the UK or Europe um, once this show goes out. So I'll pop that in the uh, at the end of the show when I'm doing the outro so I have a copy that I can send to somebody. Um, but we do have a lot of listeners in the United States and, uh, and a couple in Canada as well. So I don't know if you have any spare promo copies you could sling someone's where if we were to go down the same route. But... I do, as a matter of fact, yeah. So if, if yeah. we could run a little little thing. Sorry, as far, as far as my music goes, I recommend uh, people can use Spotify if they wish, but they're, mm. uh, the, the, the band camp, the gatelessgate.bandcamp.com is where you find my ramblings, musically speaking. Great. So we'll have a quick conversation after this or, uh, or over the next day or two and figure out some kind of criteria for how someone in North America, someone else in UK or Europe can get hold of a copy, a pristine copy of the music of the spheres and I'll keep the formerly water damaged copy for myself and stick it on the shelf with all my mohawk where I think it would fit it quite happily. Well on that freebie bombshell, thanks Alistair for coming to talk to me and Darian Toms. Um, I will be doing some editing on this, but of course we did have some slight technical problems, but hopefully that won't sound too terrible. I'll do my absolute best. But when you get something else going and you've got something else to, to talk about in terms of what you're doing next, give us a shout and we'd love to talk to you again. Well, this was a, a ton of fun. This is the most fun I've had talking to somebody in a couple of years, probably because I'm so isolated as well. But <laughs> we all are. We all have been. But, yes, indeed. But yeah, I, really, yeah. I really enjoyed this, and I'd love to be to come back and uh, dissect some more Moorcock someday. Well, that'd be great. Well, perhaps what we could do, if you're game for it, if there's a Moorcock book that you're particularly uh, fond of, come on the show and we'll cover it. I will reread my my favorites, and uh, which is probably the 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 um, no matter the time streams, that would be the one to do. Well. Well, Lord of the Air is on the list, and I don't currently have um, someone lined up to cover it with me. So maybe we can look at Wild of the Air. Yeah, well, there's a lot to talk about in that. Oh, absolutely. Right. That's great. Thanks, Alistair. And uh, we'll talk to you again soon. All right. Thanks a lot. All right, so no sooner did we get out of the lift at the bottom of Derry and Tom's, we had a brainwave and we got back in the lift and came back up to sit and have a cup of tea and discuss our idea for the competition. So so welcome back, Alistair. I know we've only been gone five minutes, although in reality it's been 24 hours. But, you know, um, 20, welcome back to virtual Derry and Tom's. Thank you. I, I feel 24 hours older. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's weird that, isn't it? So we had a quick conversation yesterday about how we would get a couple of pristine copies of the music in the spheres out. Now, I had a little think about this last night and I thought, how do we actually do this? Do we do a competition question? Do we say to people, um, buy some of Alistair's music and then you'll get a free copy? Do we say, bung a fiver to a charity of your choice and we'll send you a copy? But on every occasion... It just seemed like, how do we actually manage that? And what if five people give money to to charity and drop us a line and we're buggered because we've only got two copies? So yes. I came up with an idea, which is that I will donate this month's Patreon um, contributions to a charity of Alistair's Choice, and then we will pick at random a patron in North America and a patron in Europe, and we'll send each of them a copy of... Of, uh, of the music of the spheres. So, Alistair, how are you with that as an idea? I think that's a wonderful idea, especially considering this book has a, an activist undercurrent to it. All right. So cool. let's do it. That's what we'll do then. So what is your chosen charity? You actually suggested one yesterday, didn't you? That was Canadian. It was, and I forgot End, what it was already. End Poverty Now. End poverty now. Yes. Yeah. So that's a Canadian charity that works worldwide, doesn't it? Yes, I, I like that idea. Okay, so that's what we shall do. So, I will um, 
donate this month's Patreon payments to End Poverty Now, and then we shall pick a couple of patrons. So I've got the patron list up, and I've separated them into European patrons and North American patrons. So how do we do this? Unfortunately, because we're on opposite sides of the world, we can't tear little pieces of paper up and put them in an upturned hat, much as I'd like to. So instead, what we're going to have to do is I have put them into a table. Now, if we were in gaming land, I'd say roll D100, but we ain't got a D100, and I don't even know if you're a gamer, Alistair. You might not be. You might not have a clue what I'm talking about. Well, I'm, I'm familiar with gaming, though uh, I'm not really a gamer, no. Okay. I mean, it's something I respect, though, I assure you. <laughs> <laughs> so in that case, I'm going to say, for North America, pick a number between 1 and 100. Who, me? Mm-hmm. Oh. Uh, 26. 26 is... Hmm. That is one of our original OG patrons, Fred Keish. So, congratulations, Fred. Congratulations, Fred. I will check if I've got your address on Patreon. If not, I'll drop you a line. You can send me address, and we will send you a copy of Music of the Spheres. So, we'll go to uh, Upturned Hat number two for the UK and Europe. So, once again... Alistair, if you'd like to pick a number between 1 and 100. 47. 47 is... Da, 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 Malpertwee. Now, I have no idea of Malpertwee's actual real name. But once again, congratulations, Malpertwee. We have a pristine copy of The Music of the Spheres with your name on it. So, same as with Fred, I'll drop you a line via uh, Twitter or of the patron message system, and we'll get your address, and we'll get a copy of the Music of the Spheres on its way to you. Well, I think that was a, a, a pretty successful competition. I feel like a Saturday morning kids' TV host. <laughs> and How I do exciting. hope they, they enjoy and want this book. <laughs> <laughs> well, to be fair, um, they're, they're doing quite well on this one, because since we covered a book called Danus, The Dark Straits of Reglathium, two rather unfortunate patrons have received spare copies of that one from me and one from my co-host tash and uh, in a way receiving that book might be more considered a curse than a win so actually on this occasion i feel a little bit less guilty <laughs> well it's, it's quite a nice book package it turned out very well with the cover so it's it looks good on the shelf lovely well thanks again alistair um, and we'll catch you again soon. We were just actually having a discussion before we uh, went live on the recording. We had a long conversation after we finished recording last night, we and we talked in depth about a number of things, including War of the Worlds, and at some point in the future, um, obviously we're going to look at Warlord of the Year, but we will be branching out once again, as we've done with Wheels of Terror and the Rats, at some specific juncture in the future, and we may well put War of the Worlds on the uh, the itinerary because there's quite a few things to say about that and there's also quite a few adaptations to talk about many many as well mm, mm. Most and, of them you know bad. <laughs> yeah and we can also keep our fingers crossed we can think of some kind of weird excuse to do the peter jackson takedown but more details <laughs> on that at another time <laughs> 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 all right thanks again thanks very much alistair Thank and we'll you. head back to the uh, to the lifts and skedaddle but see you all again right soon Thanks again to Alistair for coming along to Derry and Tom's to talk about his book, The Music of the Spheres. As it happens, that damn singularity continued its attempts to disrupt us and, first, my list got skewed, and we didn't select a patron in Europe after all. And number two, our chosen Canadian charity, End Poverty Now, is no longer active. So, I dropped Alistair a line and asked him to come up with another number between 1 and 100. He chose 50, and I reviewed my revised wandering patron table, and the winner is... Asako So. So, congrats Asako So, as well as Fred and Mal Pertwee will get a copy to you as soon as possible. As for the charity, we decided to go with a contribution to Medicine Sans Frontier on behalf of the Breakfast in the Ruins patrons. So, many thanks are due to, first of all, those without a tear. Tim Cardos, 
Anthony Piconti and Sebastian Weetabix, but also to our chaos engineers Andrew Cicluna, Andrew Van Ness, Ben Fletcher, John Timothy Watt, Mal Pertwee, Nelbert, Robbo, Jim Kirkland, Dave Washman, Fred Keish, John Lays, Simon Perrins, Tony Malazzo, and, to new arrivals, Anthony Porter and Matt Saltz. Now, Matt dropped me a line to say, I got into Mocock as a teenager in the 1980s, I suppose. I'd been reading lots of SF, Asimov, Clark, etc., which my dad also enjoyed, and I got told by my mum that she'd banned him from reading Moorcock a few years earlier because he never read anything else. Anyway, I picked up a copy of The Eternal Champion for 15p at a jumble sale, the Mayflower edition with the Nicole Kidman Builder's Bum cover, and Stormbringer for 20p, the Mayflower edition with Weird Cylinder Castle with mouth floating in the sky above it, and I got hooked. That's it, really. Other than that, you've inspired me to start rereading them. Obviously a great idea, given that my pile of books to read keeps getting bigger and bigger anyway. As part of the reread, I thought I'd read the Elric ones in order, so I'm trying to work out where to put the later Dream Thief's Daughter, Screaming Tree, White Wolf's Son, Zenith the Albino, Metatemporal Detective Stories. But I'll figure it out. Thanks, and looking forward to more podcasts. And thanks to our crafty Jugaderos, Taylor, Craig Ledley, Loz, Tom Murphy, Alexander Harris, Ian Stead, Asako So, Loz, Stephen Round, and Miles Reed Labato. And also, of course, our patron demons Andy Clark, Gareth Wilson, Paul Hillary, Neil Burton, Norman Beresford, Ed Scott, Graham Holden, Joe Monty, Robert McMillan, Will Jamison, Randall Gatlin, and Mark Main. That list just seems to keep on growing. Thanks for the support, everybody. In other news, Volume 2 of the Journal is one chapter away from completion, so expect that in around September or October. As previously, PDF copies for all of the patrons and print copies for the patron demons. Ed Scott and Simon Perrins are doing great work for that in terms of art. Nan Soundtracks continue to deliver top-notch audio as we rework the earlier chapters and record the audio versions of chapters 11 and 12, and you can find the album inspired by the adventures of Gerard Arthur Connolly at Nan Soundtracks Bandcamp page. It's called Journal One, and I'll link it in the show notes. For this show, we're going to play out with one of Alistair's tracks, Soldier, loosely inspired by the Eternal Champion, and that's on his album The Complete Twilight Field, Part 2. Until next time, you can talk to us on Twitter or Instagram, the handle at Breakfast Ruins. You can email us, breakfastruins at outlook.com. Or you can check us out on the blog at breakfastintheruins.com. And of course, we have our Patreon page. One final note before I go. This book touched a nerve with me. And as mentioned in the show, we've been through a period of seeing right-wing politicians in the UK vilify what they call work culture and virtue signalling, and referencing a culture war. We've seen well-funded so-called protests in London with speakers threatening NHS workers with the noose. And since Alistair and I recorded, the right-wing press has picked a fight with, of all things, the Royal Naval Lifeboat Institute and their volunteers for saving the lives of people with brown and black skins in the English Channel. These things have taken a root in a way that I don't think I've seen in my lifetime and I grew up in the 80s. Now, I'm not personally considering turning back the clock, going mushroom picking, and living in a haze of smoke again, but the politicisation I felt as a teenager during the Thatcher government in the north of England, reading Moorcock, has been steadily building back in the last ten years, and now more than ever. We've reached a tipping point, it seems. For those of us that embrace the politics of kindness and humanity, we are the counterculture. So, stay safe, Fight the singularity, and I'll see you soon on the Moonbeam Roads.
stories often told My parents needed money So to the army I was sold I served my masters well Spreading fear across the land I don't know how many children Met the deaths at my 